Today I thought I'd take a look at the base station 2 and the sub 37. There's a huge price difference in these. This one's around £350 and this is around £1,200. So uh, the sub 37 is three times the price of the base station, which makes this seem apparently unfair, uh, possibly, um, as, a, as a comparison. But unfair on who? Uh, is it unfair on the base station because the sub 37's got all these modulation possibilities and the bigger keyboard and much more knobby interface? Or is it unfair on the sub 37 because uh, the base station too is such good value for money? Which I think might make this into sort of an interesting comparison. I'm a big fan of both companies. I've got basically sort of Planet Moog in one side of the studio. I've got, um, I've got the Sub-37, the Voyager, the Mini Moog, and I've got five, is it? One, two, three, four, five Moogafogas and a VX351 and the CP251 uh, controller units. So I've invested heavily in Moog. I love the stuff and it sounds amazing. As you know, I don't think anyone could, could disagree with that. But Novation, I'm also a really big fan of these. I bought the original base station when it came out. It's just a one unit rack and it was small. It fitted in the studio and I only had the Alpha Juno 2 at the time, which as you know, has got that one sort of alpha dial and really difficult to program. And the knobby interface on the base station one was just a revelation to me. I could really easily get sort of squelchy acid tones and do look really nice sort of trans bits and bobs with it. Uh, and after the Supernova came out, I sort of bought that immediately, and that was basically the basis for hundreds of tracks. It was I used it over everything, and I think I only sold it because I used it so much and you were inside that, I just needed some inspiration. So why do this comparison? Well, since the latest updates on this, uh, they are both very similar. They've both got two oscillators, a sub-oscillator, a flexible filter, flexible envelopes, two LFOs, a uh, paraphonic mode as well, so this is... <laughs> and duo mode, and on this I think it's... and on this you access it via this. I'll turn it on. Turn the oscillator up. So, they've got a lot more in common than um, you might first think. But there are obviously huge differences when it comes to the interfaces and the modulation possibilities. Uh, so I'm taking a look at the raw sounds really, you know, does this, does this sound as fat as this? Or does this sound as fat as that? Because maybe the huge modulation possibilities of this aren't of interest to you. And will the bass station too give you just as sort of big bass, fat, juicy tones as this can? If you're looking for sort of vintage, straight, funky bass lines, um, or maybe just sort of big, blasting EDM straight or beefy bass, you might not be interested in the modulation. Uh, or maybe you've already got sub 37, um, but this is a more compact, it's lighter, it's cheaper, uh, and could you use this live perhaps as a replacement for the sub 37? Or maybe you're just on the fence, is it worth stretching your finances to get the sub 37? Um, or will a base station actually um, suffice? Save some money, leave some extra room in the studio, get something else on top of that? Okay, so let's take a quick look at the two of them. I'm not going to go into too much detail as you can compare all the sort of specs online. This is more of a sort of hands-on experience, what it's like to play them. Um, obviously, the Sub-37 has got a lot more going on on the front panel. It's pretty much a knob per function, although with such hugely complex modulation routines, uh, there is some menu diving if you really need to. Um, go into this controller section here, look at program source and program destination. There's, I think there's nine or 10 sources and about 80 odd destinations. So you can flick through them. A lot of it though, you can just do from the front panel. So let's um, do the oscillator one um, mixer value. So volume, really simple, click and twist. But it does come with a stunningly good editor and librarian which works standalone or via your door. So here's the app, it's got an editor page for all your sort of um, synth values and everything's easily accessible. There's sort of double functions on the envelopes that you can access in here as well. Um, you can just, you know, you can change everything. It's got the sequencer in here as well, which is pretty cool. So you can go in and change the sequencer. It's got the setup pages. Um, I've not got it connected at the minute, you can see there. Uh, mapping uh, and the library with all sorts of things. So it's, uh, it's, it's really, really good editor and it works flawlessly. 
Base Station 2 has got a really good interface uh, that re massively reduces the amount of knobs needed by duplicating the functions uh, for each oscillator and having the sort of two envelopes with an envelope select switch. So just, just sort of one set of one set of sliders there. But I have to say, I do find this a little confusing when I'm dialing in the tone because I'm forever moving the decay on amp when I want to move the decay on mod, stuff like that. It's the same with the DM12. I've just got to train myself to use one knob. Obviously not as good and not as intuitive as having one knob per function, but it does massively reduce the size of the synth as well. So that might be something that's really important to you. The modulation sort of sections access via this sort of function button. So filter frequency, LFO to pitch one, LFO to speed, stuff like this. So after touch will change the speed. The mod will do filter frequency, LFO one to pitch. Um, so it's much more limited compared to, to this with its God knows how many possibilities. This is a lot more limited. But, you know, it's only £350, 250-ish used. Recent additions to uh, the operating system result in some of these things having dual or more than dual functions. So unless you're programming it regularly, you might have to refer to the updates on the user guide. Not complaining though, because the updates are amazing. And I have to commend Novation for this. I'm sure other companies would have uh, released the new version of the Synth, the Base Station 2 Pro or something, containing the new updates and having exactly the same internals, uh, leaving customers in the lurch. So absolute hats off to them for this. And quickly on to the sort of arpeggiators and the, and the sequences. They've both got arpeggiating sequences. 64 step on the Sub 37 with four separate sequences, each doing only 32 steps per patch. So you've got Sequence of one, two, three, four. Um, so quite a lot in there. But the sub 37s is much more flexible. Um, with the sub 37, you can add and remove ties, mute notes, add ratchets, change the sequence length, rotate the star point. You can add swing, change the gate length, change each step independently. Uh, and you can add a tracker modulation as well using the pitch wheel. So an awful lot you can do on this that you can't do on that. Finally, let's get to listening to some sounds out of them, shall we? So initialize patches, uh, volume's about the same. If you just quickly look at the frequency analysis on that. You don't, you don't need to look at that, do you? You can tell it sounds, sounds brighter. To make this the Sub 37, sorry, the Base Station 2 sound more like the Sub 37, you just knock it down to sort of one, two, three, four, four. About to about, what's that, three o'clock? Maybe a bit more. I don't think the sub 37's richer harmonically. I think it's just darker. So looking again at the frequency analysis quickly. Not gonna count those spikes, but they look the same, don't they? But I've noticed that about the Sub-37 before. It is darker than the Mini Moog and the Voyager and stuff. Moving on to the filters, the Sub-37's got a 6, a 12, an 18, and 24 dB mode. Obviously they get brighter, the different slopes you use. So there's the 12 again. There's the 6. It's not an incredible amount. It's still a little bit darker than it is on the on the base station two, and this is on six pole mode. But obviously, six pole mode acts differently to twenty four pole mode, or six dB acts differently to twenty four dB. So you're not going to be able to get the same sounds as bright out of this. So simply um, low pass filter, nothing else. This has got a twelve dB and a twenty four dB. Plus, it has low pass, band pass, and high pass. So the 12 dB and the 24 dB works on band pass and high pass as well. So the 12 to 24 isn't just for the low pass. Something else worth noting is that the resonance acts like it does on a standard Moog on the Sub 37. As you'd expect, when you turn the resonance up, you'll lose some bass. When I say some, I mean loads. Bass station doesn't do that, which I think is a good thing. They're both self-resonant, so let's just turn the oscillator off, resonance up, filter down. <laughs> I 
Filter tracking on this is one of the newer functions, function and filter frequency. Press it twice, and you can change the tracking on or off. Completely off, a bit out, so 0 to 7. On this, you've got filter tracking as well. Turn the oscillator off, cut frequency down, resonance up. There you go. It's Use this knob to do it, so it's a bit diff more difficult to dial this in perfectly. And this also has acid mode. So that's acting like a 303 filter. And 303 filter is a 24 dB, but acts like an 18 dB because it uses diodes, not transistors, because they're cheaper than transistors. As far as I can gather from all the mad forum stuff that you read, but it does sound different. A 303 filter sounds different to a 24 dB, and it sounds closest to 18 on this. So just for a little bit of fun, I thought I'll have a little play with this 303 filter. And I thought, what's a really simple 303 track I could make on this? And I think it was um, higher state of consciousness because it uses a G and a B, and that's it, so. <laughs> So, probe the mat into this as well. And I thought, why, why can't I get it to sound like this? It's because the gate lengths on the sequencer um, are fixed, so you can't change the, the sort of the length of the notes. So on this in particular, it's typical, isn't it? The first one to try, I can't do it on that. I'll just stop that. If we go into the batch mode, you can see. Can you see which ones of these are latched? Anyway, there you go. They're, they're the different six sequence of steps, but a couple of these are latched, um, which means I need the decay to be longer. But if the decay is longer on this, the note flows. <laughs> So just can't do this. Which is a shame, because it was the one I wanted to demo. Um, but if you're playing the keys... You know, that doesn't sound much like an acid line. But you can program it in the door to sound very, very much like a 303. Just a bit annoying because it's got the, the acid filter that it doesn't give you that um, that gate time ability. Maybe another update on Ovation, please. Keep them coming. Love it. So throwing this through a, or throwing them both through a Culture Vulture and then through the H9, a little bit of reverb in there. <laughs> Whoa! Wow, and unfortunately this sounds a bit rubbish using this line. Sounds better than that normally. So very nice, but I just can't get this out of it. <laughs> and that's the sequence set, not the sound. Yeah, it's a shame that because um, I really like this and it does do some nice effects, but it just couldn't compare with the, with the sub 37 on that. So let's move on to the envelopes now. And um, they both, as I say, got flexible envelopes. So if we go to the amp envelope on this, and we click function amp envelope twice, we get, um, it becomes uh, another LFO effectively. 
The envelopes on the Sub 37 are pretty cool. They've got delay, attack, hold, decay, sustain, release. Obviously, you can just use the ADSR normally, um, but you can enter the second mode here. So I've just set this up to show you a sound. Maybe turn the envelope generator amount up. So all that's doing there is it's, it's delaying until it comes in and then it's holding for a certain time as well. If I put that on attack and decay at zero, and get, I should be getting a, and loop it, should get a, a sort of a, a square LFO. And you can sync this to the to the arpeggiator or the LFOs as well. So all of a sudden you're getting FM from a synth that doesn't do FM. The LFO rates are pretty quick on this, so you can do it sort of almost via LFO as well. If you go to the high range, filter amount. You don't have that on this, but you do have oscillator filter mod, which is similar to the Dave Smith oscillator filter mod. I don't forgot what it's called on that, but you have it on the Tempest, the Rev 2, and the Prophet 8, whereby one of the oscillators um, modulates the filter. So turn it off. I think this is oscillator 2 on this. So if we just change oscillator 2 frequency, you want oscillator 2, yeah? So you still get those sort of FM style sounds from this. Much more flexible on this then. Okay, let's take a look at some sounds now. If you fast forwarded to this bit, you might want to go back and have a look at the 303 sounds I did earlier uh, and then come back to this. But I'm going to start off with a sawtooth. And what's really strange straight away is that through the headphones I've got on, which are these Sennheiser DT880s, which are pretty decent headphones, this sounds much bassy, the bass station. And the Sub 37 sounds a bit weedy, but through my monitors, which are KH310, so they're pretty decent, you know, 3,000 pound monitors, they sound almost identical. So, um, you know, when people say, oh, they all sound completely different. Well, it depends on what you're listening on. But it does mean that they do sound different. Okay, so, I mean, looking at the frequency analysis on these, they both look the same, and they're the same volume as well, but this sounds a lot louder, the bass station. So, moving on from there, really. Let's add a little bit of envelope to the to the frequency. So you can get obviously very similar tones, but it does it instantly it makes you feel like they do sound slightly different, don't they? If I just play with the frequency here. That's got a, a, a wider, more open sound, I think. And the Moog's a bit sort of more enclosed, a bit warmer, maybe. Or darker, or duller. But there's definitely a distinct character there, isn't there? But doesn't mean that you can't make similar sounds and this can't emulate that. 
for certain sounds, obviously. We're sounding pretty good there, I think. Uh, let's now add an extra oscillator. Let's add, add oscillator two, still on a sawtooth. Let's just turn that one down and this one up. This one's sounding deeper, isn't it? Well, it is on these headphones. When I prepare this, I go through it and I have a listen and I have a listen to the different synths and I think how am I going to show the differences in them. And I generally do that while I've got the, the speakers on. But, uh, you know, when I come to record, I generally have the headphones on so that I don't get any spillage from these. But it's always different. Uh, this is sounding brighter, isn't it, again? Again, Moog sounding darker, and I don't think it's the envelope amount. Really fine adjustments make a big difference when you're trying to match them. So let's add in the first oscillator again. I've got one slightly louder than the other. Don't know why, it's just what I started doing. And you can hear in that, I and mean, it's DCO this, and whether this is a DCO thing, slight sort of phasing. Nothing on that, is there? One oscillator, two oscillators. So one oscillator, two. Really phasey, but luckily, this has got this really fine control over your oscillator tuning. So, it's not the same. Instantly, they're starting to show the differences here, aren't they? So, as I say, it could be a VCO thing. This is slightly drifting, uh, and this isn't. This is locked on. If you ever played the Juno 106 and you've tried to play it in unison mode, you'll know what I mean. So, the characters are really coming out now, aren't they? Uh, let's add the sub. So I've got a sub one octave low on a square, which is what this is. This is sounding mellower, I think. This has got a roughness to it. But as I say, both really nice, aren't they? Let's explore that to oscillator thing again a little bit more let's change the frequency on oscillator 2 on the on the Moog get a little beat and they can hear the beating bum 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 let's do the same on this oscillator 2 Again, this is sounding, I think this is sort of sounding more swirly. This has got maybe, maybe more Rolandy sound, I don't know, a bit more modern, a bit more old school perhaps. A bit unfair, uh, the bass station hasn't got that many keys, I'll try again. And now this is sounding a little brighter. The Mogus. So we add the sub to that. Beautiful and fat that. Uh, Moog. Let's 
So this is, the base station's consistently brighter, isn't it? Let's just change that modulation envelope depth a little bit more. <laughs> And you see this, this the, the Moog now sounds a tiny bit brighter, doesn't it? So. So different characters, but I do think if you're, uh, you know, if you've got the Sub 37, as I said earlier, and you fancy, uh, you know, and these are the sort of sounds you play. So this is, was called Fat Funk, I think, originally, and I sort of played around with it. There, you know, this would could take over the duties of the sub 37, possibly live. But they have got the distinct tones, haven't they? Let's add. I think this originally had some um, multi drive on. Now the multi drive on the on the sub 37 really does increase the volume considerably. So if I just hold this C. About 10 dB, so you've got to be careful with that. So I'll turn this down a tad. We'll add the distortion on this. The distortion on this, uh, as I showed with the TB303 example, is different, but it's really nice. Doesn't add as much volume. So potentially it's easier to use, especially in a live situation. Just turn it down a little bit, just because that's a bit, maybe a little bit too much. But still both nice, aren't they? Overall, I'm liking the Sub 37 more than the base station. But as I said earlier, I'm a real fan of base station, you know, and these are well, three times the price, so, you know. This, the base station also has this overdrive. Let's turn the distortion down. So the overdrive on, on the base station seems to do play nicer with the multi-drive on the on the base station, on the sub-37, I should say. Another little trick on the Sub-37 is this feedback circuit, so extra distortion. So we've got the two distortions on this, the multi-drive and the feedback. Let's do the two on the base station. <laughs> Yeah, base station's got like a much more sort of rougher, sort of brisk, sort of nasty tone to it, and the sub 37's much sort of mellower, maybe richer. <laughs> but, yeah, so I'd say the base station's got like a real modern tone, hasn't it? that just knocked off the second oscillator on there do the same down here and turn the modulation envelope depth off so that's definitely sort of got a vintagey sound I think and the bass station more modern Let's move on to a little bit of PWM then. I've set these up so the square wave on oscillator one. Modulated by LFO, obviously. The 
the base station's a lot more controllable when it comes to this, for just doing your sort of standard PWM sounds, because the maximum it'll go is here. <laughs> Real easy to set up. The sub 37, you've got to stick it between pulse and um, thin pulse. And look at the small amount, it's just like barely past sort of one o'clock there on the modulation two amount. It goes way past, way beyond. Way beyond what you might think is useful. So a little more tricky to set up on the sub 37, but the effect are the same effectively, aren't they? And you'll notice I've kept the frequency of the base station 2 on the VCF just around there, around 3 o'clock, to keep it sort of a little bit duller to, to match with the sub-37. Nice, try over here. Maybe add a bit of sub. Try that on the base station. Thick that isn't it? Sub 37 is easy to control the LFL rate actually because you've got high range and low range. So on the low range, you get lots of manipulation. Um, to really fine tune it. And you've got all this from here. Super, so super slow. So. Oh, uh, you don't have quite as much flexibility on the uh, base station. So yeah, the base station can't really compete when it comes to this sort of stuff. That's insane, isn't it? But the bass station's giving you those really nice, rich, classic, thick tones. Let's take a look at a bit of hard sync then. I do like a bit of sync. Um, on this, on the Sub 37, it's just the hard sync button there. On the Space Station, it's Function and where is it? Oscillator 1 and 2 Sync. So it's on. And um, what I've done is I've set up Oscillator 1 just as a square. And I've synced Oscillator 2 as a sawtooth on, over above that using LFO1 on this and LFO2 on this. You can use either for the sub-37, but you, you have to use LFO1 if you're gonna use the LFO. So this is the base station. And here's the sub-37. Add oscillator one in. Same here, oscillate one and some sub. Really nice. 
nice that, isn't it? Base station, I might as well show, base station, sorry, the Sub-37, I might as well show you a few little bits that you can do with the LFOs on this, just because there's more modulation options, so. Let's add pitch amount from LFO 1 to add to the LFO 2. So that's just a square wave and it's obviously picking out different parts of the of the ramp. And because the sync it's picking the same ones out each time with the keyboard reset as well. And I've got this um, envelope here, the filter envelope on loop. Uh, put some envelope amount on there as well. So now the filter is being looped as well in sync with the envelope generator. So there's lots more you can do there, isn't there? Let's adjust the filter with one of these as well. And this is where the Sub-37 really shines in that I, I'm just messing around demonstrating this and I'm just starting getting pulled in, I'm getting pulled into doing some sort of weird, strange, modulated, sort of odd sound. Imagine sticking that through a few effects, all of a sudden you've got like a whole soundscape straight from that. So you can't emulate what you've done on the Sub-37 with the base station, but this is a patch of a bass done, just messing about for a few minutes. So that's really nice as well. Again, imagine that with a lot of effects on. So if all the different modulation options that you have on the Sub-37 aren't really of interest to you, the base station's such good value for money. Especially considering all the new sort of add-ons to it, like I mentioned earlier. But in conclusion, um, yeah, you know, if I, if I had to choose between the two, obviously it's gonna be the Sub-37. But the base station, if I was going out gigging and I wasn't using sort of intricate noises, wasn't doing sort of maybe ambient stuff or trying to do soundscapes, the base station's got so much oomph in that sub, it's just, you know, it's a really fantastic bit of kit, this. But, you know, if, you th if you're wondering which one to buy and, you know, do you save up extra, if you're not going to use those extra bits, well, the base station is, you know, it's, it's quality, quality, isn't it? But if you're on the fence, you're thinking, do a save up a bit more and get the sub-37. If you're not going to use those extra bits, the base station might be just the thing for you. It's got real depth to it. There's loads you can do. You can get absorbed in that for for an awful long time. And if you pick up a second-hand one, you know, you can always sell it for what you bought it for while you're still saving for the Sub-37. Give yourself some ideas. In fact, that's exactly what I'll do. There's my conclusion. Buy this, used, and then sell it once you've saved up to get one of them. Or do exactly what I've done uh, and keep them both. <laughs>